Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're here and and a part of our worship. um, We don't have any first-time guests with us. We're just, uh, uh, and if you're not a first-time guest, you're, you're, you're not a guest anymore. You're family. And so we want you to just feel right at home today as we worship. It's, it's good day to be inside in the air conditioning. And uh, let me also say happy Father's Day. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Father's Day in a little bit. But right now I'd like to tell you about some things that are happening in the life of the church this week. Just go past that. We're not doing that this week. All right. And uh, stock the kitchen. There are a few more things on there. Um, this will be the last time we see that. If you have not already gotten a card, they're on the back table back there. And uh, you can see what uh, we have left in the Amazon registry for Stock the Kitchen. Uh, we are uh, taking up, uh, not taking up, I'm, I'm taking interest in going on a mission trip to Lynch, Kentucky in October. If you're interested in that, uh, come see me uh, and we will uh, uh, get your name on, on that list. All right, now this is what I wanted to get to. Starting tomorrow, actually starting yesterday, look at all this. If you have a chance, go through the building. Uh, A lot of people worked very hard yesterday. Uh, I looked, um, people comment about me wearing two watches. Uh, One of them is there just to uh, tell me things like how many steps I took and and how many uh, stairs I climbed. Inside this one, inside this two-story building with one flight of stairs, I walked 11,000 steps and, and climbed 11 flights of stairs. So that was just me. That was just me. And I was and, and there were others who were working and working hard. Um, you know, we had uh, a lot of volunteers. If you missed breakfast yesterday, man, you missed breakfast. Uh, that, was the, that was the best breakfast in, in the county yesterday. Uh, so uh, I appreciate that. And uh, we had a great time, but VBS kicks off tomorrow with a kickoff party, um, and uh, we're going to have inflatables and games and food and fun and and just like the slide says. Uh, So we want you to come, be a part. Uh, If you can come and just watch the kids and make sure, you know, help us wrangle kids. We're hoping to have a lot of kids, a lot of families come and be a part of that. We want you to be a part of that. Uh, And kids... Let me say this. One of the things we've done is we have set up, we have uh, uh, Annette as our director this year, and she said, you know what would be great if we had a prize for the child who invites the most people that come. They have to to come with them, who brings the most people. And so we do have a prize for both a, a, the, Older children, we were divided into two groups, preschool and elementary age. We have a prize for our preschool, and we have a prize for our elementary age. So I um, uh, want you to invite as many as you can. The invitations start. Uh, we're going to register starting tomorrow night. And uh, if they were invited by you, make sure and let us know. And we will have invite cards there so that we'll know uh, who, who it is and who they were invited by. So that party is tomorrow night. We do need some people who can be here by 5 o'clock to help set up uh, with inflatables, uh, to help set up the inflatables and help get things set up for the the fun tomorrow night. And then VBS kicks off Tuesday night. A lot of fun, a lot of energy. Um, Rest today because you're going to need it. Um, VBS kicks off uh, tomorrow night through Friday. Uh, and uh, we've been through this. Uh, we've got our volunteers. We'll recognize them at the end of the service, but uh, we want you to uh, uh, be in prayer for, for our Vacation Bible School. We have kids who are already asking about, about salvation and being baptized who are going to be at Vacation Bible School. Uh, we have kids who need to, need to talk about that, who uh, are going to be in vacation Bible school, and that's what it's about. It's this is an evangelistic outreach. It's we have fun. We have, uh, I get to dress up like somebody else um, and and do all sorts of fun things up here. Uh, but 
it's all about getting the gospel to the kids. So be in prayer uh, for, for our kids this week. And then uh, our next Super Saturday, I misspoke uh, uh, last week. It is not the Saturday after Vacation Bible School. Um, Miranda said, oh, no, oh, no, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it is July the 20th, Saturday, July 20th, our next Super Saturday uh, for the kids, and it's to go to uh, Strike and Spare in Hendersonville, uh, and the price for the ticket is on there, uh, and it includes all sorts of things. So if you can come and be a part of that and bring, and, 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 uh, bring your parents, that would be great. <laughs> Um, the association does a men and boys camp out and I, this is their picture so I'm normally I would do something bigger it's Saturday September 6th and 7th uh, it's September 6th and 7th it's a men and boys camp out guys if you have kids or grandkids that uh, would would uh, benefit from that time out and time just away um, uh, let me know and we'll get you registered for that we are continuing to uh, uh, collect for Operation Christmas Child. If uh, you have any questions or if you have anything that you need to collect, uh, see Gail Smith uh, with questions or uh, to, yeah, this is Gail. Gail, stand up so everybody will know. You're, all right. We're, we're, we're small enough that we learn everybody quickly, but uh, just make sure. And I think that is it. Happy Father's Day. Father's Day, uh, I got... Uh, my Father's Day, when I first woke up this morning, one of the first things I do uh, when I get up is um, I have to go and take my blood pressure and, and weigh, and, and it's all part of this second watch thing. But uh, so I grab my phone, and, you know, I also look at Facebook. And the very first thing I saw was my daughter had posted uh, a Father's Day, a very nice Father's Day uh, saying now we all um when we when we think about father's day uh let's start with this we have a video for you we'll start with the video today is a day of celebration a day to honor the men who've shaped us led us and walked us through life it's a day to say thanks to all the dads for all the times your strength held us up and the moments your wisdom lit our path for encouraging us to seek God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength for living your life as an example of what a man of God should be. Thank you for the discipline we deserved and the grace we did not, for the memories we treasure and the lessons we cherish. Today, we thank God for all the ways you've shaped our lives. We love you, Dad. When we think about our dads, some of us can think of a dad like that. Uh, and some of us are like the little boy in Sunday school who, when the Sunday school teacher was talking about their heavenly father, said, if God is like my old man, I want nothing to do with him. Today is Father's Day, though. There are men who uh, have, have been blessed by with with many uh, kids and many children who love them and and uh, some who have children who are wayward and they've not heard Father's Day. But we thank God for dads. Uh, my dad taught me a lot, and uh, I. I share a lot of that with you, whether you know it or not. Uh, but uh, uh, we thank God for dads and the examples that they are in our lives. And we're going to pray right now. 
for our debts. Father, you are good. For those of us who are fathers, you are our example. God, I'm, I'm reminded of the parable of the prodigal son. And the father who, when the son says, give me all that is coming to me, the father says, okay. And the son went wayward. But the father continued to watch. And when the son came home, the father ran to him. And hugged his neck and told him he is still his son. And God, we thank you that that was a parable about you and your love for us. But Father, those of us who are dads, whether our children are adults or young, help us to be that example of a father follow your example. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so let me just say, Happy Father's Day. Now as we begin our worship, we're going to begin it as, as we have and as we will continue to do in, in singing a psalm, if you will. We're going to recite Psalm 119. One, psalm 119, by the way, if you'll stand with me as you stand, is, is about God's Word. The whole longest psalm is about God's Word. It's about Scripture. And we want to, uh, you to hear the Word of the Lord as we go, as we recite. So Ray's going to lead us, and then we'll follow. Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I have solemnly sworn to keep your righteous judgments. I am severely afflicted. Lord, give me... Give me life according to your word. Lord, please accept my free will offerings of praise and teach me your judgments. My life is constantly in danger, yet I do not forget your instruction. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not wandered from your precepts. I have your decrees as a heritage forever. Indeed, they are the joy of my heart. I am resolved to obey your statutes to the very end.
Father, you are worthy of worship. When we worship you, we're, we're saying that, that you are worth all that we have and all that we are. And so, God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came and died on the cross and rose again, that we can worship you as your children and not as, not as some, some, somebody who doesn't know you. God, I pray for those who don't know you today, that as we worship together, as we, as we worship through your word and worship through song and worship through teaching and, and, and all the ways we worship, Father, I pray that they would see your worth and they would come to put their trust in your son Jesus and what he did on the cross for their salvation, that they would know you. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is my Father's world and to my listening sings and round me rings the music of the spheres this is my father's world unrest me in the thought of rocks and trees of skies and seas his hand of wonder wrought this is my father's world, the birds that carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. Today's Bible reading from Proverbs 4, 1 through 15, a father's wise instruction. Hear, O sons, a father's instruction, and be attentive that you may gain insight. For I give you good precepts. Do not forsake my teaching. When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my word, let my commandments, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland she will bestow on you a beautiful crown 
Hear my son and accept my words that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the paths of, of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered. And if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction and do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not go onto it. Turn away from it and pass by. We want to have a word of prayer for this being Father's Day. We want to pray to our Heavenly Father. And at the end of it, I'm going to also read from Matthew 6, what is known as the Lord's Prayer, probably, probably called the Model Prayer. And if you know it, feel free at the end of that prayer to say it aloud with me. But let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the Father of those whom you have redeemed. We thank you, Father, for... Those who are redeemed were not just sons and daughters, but doubly so. One through the rebirth, regeneration, but also legally through adoption. We are yours, Father, because you have declared it so, and you have made us yours through the work of your Son. And Father, I say that this morning knowing that you are mine and I'm yours because of Jesus, my heavenly Father. And I thank you, Father, for my dad, who raised me to know you, to know the word of God, to be guided by it. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that me being a dad, that I will follow in the precepts, that I will lay hold of understanding, that this charge to all of us men who are fathers will be followed out of love for you and your word. And Father, we pray to you this morning, as Jesus taught us to pray, by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
Let's sing an arm of strength and glory and power be to you.
It's time for our testimony of transformation, and it helps if I look up the sign or look up the slide. It's time for our transformer testimony of transformation. Uh, Miranda came to us about five years ago, and she came to us, and and she was in seminary, just started seminary, and and um, uh, she was just. Um, uh, did you did you forget to unplug? She had just started seminary, and, 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 and she was single, and there was no guy in her life, and we had all of her time. And then she didn't meet a guy because she's known him for a long time, but uh, they kind of noticed each other. And um, that's how we got Davis. Davis has been a, a blessing to us in many ways. Uh, if you don't know, Davis works with our youth. On Wednesday nights, with he and Elizabeth work with our teenagers on Wednesday night, and then uh, he uh, also uh, teaches our young adult Sunday school class on Sunday morning. He and Miranda teach that, and so we put him to work as soon as he got here. Uh, and uh, but he has a testimony of uh, transformation that uh, I've asked him to share. I would say he'd like to share, but truth is, I've asked him. So Davis, if you'll come and share that. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just start saying that uh, growing up, um, my family was always in church. Um, ever since like my parents could take me into the church, I was there. Um, I grew up homeschooled from um, probably like kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. I graduated with homeschooling. So growing up, I was in the church. Um, you know, I was told about Jesus, but um, when I was younger, I really didn't, um, it didn't really click with me. And so I could give you all the answers if you told me, well, who is Jesus? And I was like, well, he's the son of God, you know, and um, I'd say, you know, Jesus is the only way, but mm, it still didn't really click with me until I was nine years old. So it was at night, and um, I was either, when I was a kid, I was either watching two things. I was watching cartoons, or I was watching National Geographic Channel or the Science Channel. I was really into animals or science. That was the big thing for me when I was that age. And I remember sitting there, and I can't remember the name of the show, but the premise was this guy was uh, kind of going over in like a skit of like, if you got, um, if you had five venomous snake, what would happen to you if you couldn't get help? And I remember he was in Australia. I remember watching that, and I remember something in my head coming in me saying, if I died today, if I was in that scenario, or any other scenario like that, if I died today, 
how, what would guarantee me if I went to heaven? I was like, I was sitting there and I was like, I can't think of anything. I'm like, well, I'm nine years old. Well, I hadn't done anything great. I, I obeyed my parents. But then I was sitting there going like, yeah, well, I kind of did that so that I could be on their good side. You know, I didn't want to get in trouble. So I sat there and I was like, well, I don't want to think about this. So I just won't go to Australia. That's what my nine-year-old brain went. I won't go to Australia. Well, I went, well, like there's venomous snakes, here, venomous snakes here. And then I started thinking, what else could happen to me? And so I was just thinking, I, I'm going to have to know. I can't figure out what will guarantee me to get into heaven. And so my mom was in the living room with me, and then another fear came up. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I ought to know this. I don't know how to get into heaven. And so I was so nervous to ask my mom this question that I sat there and I, and I was like, oh, I can't ask her. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Oh, no. I sh should know this. Well, eventually, eventually um, got the curse to ask her. And she looks at me very calmly and goes, let me get your dad. And immediately I went, I'm in trouble. I'm going to be in so much trouble. I'm going to get a butt whooping or something taken away from me. I'm like, I've done it. But that didn't happen. My dad came in and um, he told me the gospel. He did a very simple gospel presentation. I can't really remember what he said, but I, I do know he had a gospel presentation. And like I said, I grew up in church. I've heard the gospel before. But that was, it, that night, that was the first night that I truly comprehend what the gospel was. I comprehended that, oh, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against God. I've done wrong. And, it, and I was, it was like, it was like, I did wrong. I was like, oh, I did. I've done wrong. I, I, I need to ask for his forgiveness. I broke down crying. And I've asked, I've told my parents this before, and they did not understand why I was crying. <laughs> they were just like, it was a simple gospel presentation. They didn't really say anything, but I was, in my mind, God was convicting me and telling me I need to get right with him and then I prayed I said God I, in, in my kid brain at the moment I was like I want you I want this I want your forgiveness and so I prayed the prayer I was you know still crying you know snotting tears still falling down and so I find myself going back to my room and so my room was like at the end of the hallway when I got there I realized Oh, it's dark. And if you haven't guessed from the story, uh, I do have a little bit of anxiety <laughs> with certain things. And my wife could definitely tell you some stories since she's been married to me. Um, I, and I found myself in the dark. I wasn't scared of the dark itself. What I was scared of, what would be in the dark. Like I would think, okay, what if my parents left the window open and then someone got in there and they didn't know it and then I come in the room and then someone steals me. That's, that's how my mind would work. So, or like an animal got in somehow and it's going to, you know, I'm going to, it's going to attack me or something. So I sat there and I went, oh no, I am in the dark. Like half the house was dark. And then I was thinking, oh great, I'm going to get scared. I'm going to get scared. I'm going to get anxious. And all of a sudden it was like a snap. And I wasn't scared. I was looking around the room and I was like, well, okay, this is weird. I don't know what's going on here because <laughs> I'm not scared. And I had this weight <laughs> off my shoulders, just like I was carrying something for years. And I was sitting there in the, my room in the dark, just perplexed and just happy, full of joy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've never felt this calm in my life before. I've never had this type of peace. I sat down there and I was going through everything. I was like, oh my gosh, this life is wonderful. It's just, it was like everything was new. And, you know, now that I realized God was giving me peace and he was, he was saving, he saved me. His spirit came into me. He was giving me peace. Unfortunately, I learned later on that I still have a little form of anxiety still. I do it to this day. Um, I can get fixated on something, and if I don't know the answer to something, I will literally sit there for hours going, I need to figure this out. 
because if I figure it out and something goes wrong, I can be prepared for it. But here's the difference that being saved has brought that into the picture. Is that I don't have to worry anymore. Um, because God has saved me, he's given me peace. Because he has saved me, I, am, I belong to him. I have a relationship with him, and he has a plan for me. And, this, and the, you know, hey, things are going to happen. Listen, things are going to happen wrong, but the thing that I know through my salvation is that God has a plan for me, and if it's, and if it's not something I want to do or if something bad's happening, I go, God has something in this for me or for someone, and it's benefits, this benefits God, and this will hopefully benefit me or someone else. And that's what gives me peace. And, hey, I'm going to be honest with you. There's some days I got to remind myself that, of who he is and who I am to him. And then 30 minutes later, I got to do it all over again because I find myself going back again, worrying about it. And lastly, I'll say, not only has this helped me, um, this has helped other people. God has allowed his, um, his comfort in me to let other people know, wait a minute, you're, you're so comfortable in this. How, how how, how are you so calm in this? And I go, it's not me, it's God. God gives me the peace in that. And he's been able to use that to, uh, to uh, show others Jesus. And um, so that's my uh, um, testimony of transformation. So thank you. If you have your Bibles, turn with me, open them to click on Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. I thought I'd get in the 21st century. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. I've, uh, we're continuing to look at transformed liberties. I've titled this one, Part 3, A New Hope. They got it. They got it. My Star Wars nerds got it. All right. Uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, read like this. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instructions, so that we may have hope through endurance and through encouragement from the scriptures. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your word, for your word is truth. God, help us to see how we are to live in harmony with one mind and one voice through you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. I'm a picky eater, or at least that's what I'm told. I, I don't think I'm that picky of an eater, but people tell me I'm a picky eater. Um, I, I have discriminating tastes. It's, that's kind of where I am on this. I, I, there are foods I will not eat. Typically, I don't eat anything that breathes water. Nope. It all tastes like the bottom of the pond to me. I don't care. You can tell me, well, it doesn't taste fishy. It tastes fishy. Same thing with coffee. I will not drink coffee. I don't like the smell of coffee. I don't like coffee. I don't like the smell of coffee. I don't care how you doctor it up. Put it in ice cream. Put it in candy. Put candy in it. I don't care. It's still coffee. Bitter brown water. It's what it is. You know, uh, I've had some fun with people over the years talking about my taste, and, and I've also received a ton of criticism over what I won't eat. But I've never lost a friend over it. I've never lost a friendship over it. I've never had a battle 
over what I eat or what I don't eat. But that's not what's happening in the church in Rome. Our scripture these last three weeks have been about eating and drinking, believe it or not. Or at least that's the background for the teaching that the scripture is giving us, that the Holy Spirit is giving us through Paul's writing. You know, there, some would eat and drink any type of meat and drink wine while others still held to the Jewish dietary laws. And, and, and they would bring these differences to the common meals or the love feasts that they would have. We call them fellowship dinners. And someone would look at someone who brought, who brought this, this nice pulled pork and say, I can't fellowship with you because you're eating that. And they would sit somewhere else. And, and, and the people who were not eating pork and not eating and were following the dietary laws were being talked about by those who did and vice versa. And so... They, they did this not because, like me, they had a pickiness and didn't like the food, but because their food choice was based on their understanding of this new Christian faith that they had. They were all new in the faith. And the faith was new. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to go to. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to address this, that, that schism, that division in, in this part of the letter to them. And he addresses the, the issue in an ascending order. Now, if you'll remember in part one, at the very first part of um, chapter 14, each section of scripture we've, we've done has, has been in ascending order on how we're to get together. And that first part of 14, we're told that we're not to judge those who have a different opinion on non-essentials. Uh, you know, that means we don't raise non-essential matters to the salvation level. He doesn't eat what I eat, must not, so he must not be a Christian. Or he eats what God forbade, so he must not be a Christian. That's raising those two a salvation level. We're not to do that. That would be the judging. But the second part of chapter 14, we're told that instead of judging, that we're not to harm the other one. The key verse of that section was verse 15. Don't, don't destroy by what you eat someone for whom Christ died. We're to watch our own actions. We're to, we're to uh, because others are watching them, and we don't want what we do to be a stumbling block to others who are weaker in their faith. And too often, people watch other people, and they judge Jesus. And so we need to be careful with that. Right or wrong, we still need to be careful with that, because that's what the Holy Spirit tells us. Here in this section, we're taking it up a notch. We're to see not, not only are we not to judge, and not only are we not to... Are, are we to watch what, what we, that we don't hurt a brother or sister, but that we're to live in a way that we build up those around us? We, we lift them up. We edify them, if you will. Build them up. Paul breaks these verses into these six verses I just read into three different sections. Each one, two verses. In verses one and two, he shows us that we have an obligation to others. In verse 3 and 4, he shows us that we have an example of that obligation in Christ. And in verse 5 and 6, he tells us that we have an encouragement for that obligation in God the Father. And so let's take a look at those, let's take a look at those three things that the Holy Spirit is telling us through Paul and through God's Word today as we look closer at these six verses. The first thing, as I said, we see we have an obligation to others. Paul begins talking directly to the strong. Now, remember, he divided the, his discussion. He had the strong and he had the weak. The strong uh, were those who were stronger in their faith than the weak. They, had, they understood the grace that God gave and didn't, didn't try to live by the law. 
Paul identifies with the strong. He, in chapter 4, verse 14, he says, I know and am persuaded in the Lord that Jesus is nothing, that in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. He says that to the strong that in faith we have an obligation to the weak. That word translated obligation is translated many ways throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament. And, and sometimes it's translated owe. Others it's translated debt. It's a financial, it's, it's like a financial obligation, a financial transaction. And, and, and so we owe, our, we owe others. Back in chapter 13, Paul wrote, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. This obligation that Paul is writing about is an obligation to, to love others. It's a debt of love toward our brothers and sisters. But it, it's more than just not judging or, or not putting a stumbling block in their way. It's, it's an obligation to bear their weakness. You know, not judging takes a little energy and none of our resources. Not hurting takes more energy and some of our resources, but not most. If we're honest, we can do that. But bearing their weakness will take our energy and our resources because we have to come alongside them to bear their weakness. Have you ever seen somebody carrying something really heavy and they're barely making it and they're, they're trying, to, trying to get it from one place to another and they're carrying it and they're barely making it and, and you're over on the other side of the room going, hey, I'm with you. You got this. I'm right here. Well, that doesn't help them at all, does it? But if you come alongside and say, here, let me have a corner. You're bearing their weakness. This is what Paul's talking about, coming alongside them and bearing their weakness. It means being strong for them and helping them become stronger. It means denying ourselves for their good. That's what it means to not please others, no, or not to please ourselves, rather. It means denying ourselves, our own pleasure, to help others. And it goes on, it says, our obligation is to please our neighbors. Each one is to please his neighbor for his own good, to build him up. Now, to please a neighbor is not to compromise the gospel. There are men pleasers. There are, there are pastors out there who, who tell people what they want to hear. I, I, can name, I can think of about five or six that are on the internet and TV right now. That, that have strong, strong gatherings every Sunday because they tell people what they want to hear. That's not what he's talking about. Paul did not please people to please them. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, he says, For I am now trying, for am I now trying to persuade people or God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. We cannot be about pleasing people. We will take the stands that are not popular. People will not like us for clinging to God's word. The neighbor Paul is referring to here is your believing neighbor, your brother or sister, the one sitting around you in church. Look around. Look around. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you might know who's there. But look around, behind you, beside you. It's them. It's them. It's and we're to work together to please them for their good, to build them up in the faith. A good example of this is Paul's description of his ministry in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 19 through 23. It's one of my favorite descriptions of ministry. As a matter of fact, I've based my ministry on this passage. 
Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak, I have become weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that I might, by every possible means, save some. Now, I do all this because of the gospel, so that I may share in the blessings. Paul worked to meet people where they were at their level, bringing the gospel into their lives. For unbelievers, the gospel provides salvation. For believers, the gospel provides strength and edification. It builds us up. We are commanded to please others, but only where it builds them up and not where it fulfills their desires. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, at the end of this sermon and come back around to that and how we can do that. But we have an example in Christ and in Scripture of how we all have this obligation and, at, um, and in this debt. In Romans 8.29, it says that we are to be conformed to the image of Christ that God is conforming us to the image of Christ. And if we're to be conformed to the image of Christ, he is to be our example. Jesus described his life as one lived for others. John 8, 29, he says, The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone because I always do what pleases him. He lived for God. He lived for the Father. In John 6, 38, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He lived. He worked for the Father. In Matthew 20, 25 through 28, Jesus called them over. It says, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. It must not be like that among you. On the contrary, who wants, whoever wants to become Great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. He lived his life and died for us. He is our example. Now, too often we look around for our example. There are good examples here on earth. For example, uh, for, for those of us who have been here for a while, the, the greatest example that this church knows is Jesse Gaines. Uh, if you did not get an opportunity to get to know Jesse, you, you, you missed getting to know a saint of God, a, a man of God. And he was a good example, and we would do well to imitate Jesse on Father's Day. Uh, is we, would, we may look to our dad as that example of how to live. But Jesus is the example and the only measure. He is the, the standard of how we're to live as believers. He didn't look to please himself but to serve others, and that's the example we should see. Now, it goes on in verse Three, it says, on the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That sentence comes from Psalm 69, 9. And, and it says, because the zeal for your house has consumed me and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. This psalm is a passion psalm prophesying how Jesus would die. And Paul is giving us a theological reason. He's, he's giving us that, that, theological, that theology for the obligation to bear the witnesses, bear the weaknesses, rather, of others. You see, it's not just a, a because we're told so. It's because it's all part of God's plan. We're not only obligated to them as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we're also obligated to them because of Christ and his servant death on our behalf. Because Christ died for us, we're obligated to live for the good of others. 
Paul then points to the scripture written in the past. Now I realize it's past noon. You're going to have to hang with me. He points, he, he points to the scripture written in the past as being written for our instruction, providing hope through endurance and encouragement. God has given us the instruction of scripture to provide hope for those of us who, that we would endure. Remember when Paul wrote the Romans, the scripture was our Old Testament. Too often we lo- overlook the Old Testament. and and thinking it doesn't apply to us today because, after all, we're a New Testament church under a new covenant. Yet Jesus said that the scriptures of the Old Testament testify of me, of Christ. And after his resurrection with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he said, then beginning with Moses, that's Genesis, and all the prophets, that takes you to Malachi. He interpreted for them the things concerning himself in the scripture. We should read and study the scriptures, both old and new, because they provide encouragement for us to be that, that person who bears we- the weaknesses of others. For just like the scripture quoted provides hope and endurance to those needing to think of others. But we not only have scripture, we have God as our encourager. Verses 5 and 6 are a prayer of benediction. And in this benediction is the first of five prayers that we're going to see in the rest of Romans. And we're, when we think of endurance, we think of striving to endure. We think of practicing. We, we think of the, the marathon, of the marathon runner running twice the length of a marathon so that he can run a marathon. We think of, of football practice where you're out doing two-a-days in weather like this so that you can you can run uh, playing football. We think of, uh, when we think of endurance, we think of military endurance where they have them in boot camp running and, and marching and, and all of that so that they can make it through the day. And, and all of those come from within. But the scripture tells us that our real endurance, our real hope comes from God. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony. It's God who provides our endurance and our encouragement, and he provides it so that we can live in harmony with one another. Now I hadn't thought of that until about 1 o'clock this morning. That word harmony, living in harmony. I'm going to step into Ray and Wade's and and Ray and Wade's uh, area right now, and, and and they're going to they could tell you a whole lot better. Anyone else in here with a music background can tell you a whole lot better about harmony than what I am about to tell you. But here's what I know because I looked it up. Harmony is created when different notes, some natural some sharp, some flat, are played together in such a way that they provide a sound that has a pleasing effect on the ear. Living together in harmony doesn't mean that we're all cookie-cutter Christians, that we're all act alike, dress alike, like all the same things. We can have different opinions, but we live together in unity just as Jesus prayed we would. We can be different, but living together in harmony. Because each note adds to that chord that provides the harmony. And it is greater. They're greater together than they are apart. John 17 records what is called Jesus' high priestly prayer. And in that prayer, Jesus prays for a disciple, and, he's, and he prays, then he prays for us. He says, I pray not only for these, his disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. May they all be one. He prayed that we live together in harmony. And this is what Jesus is praying in this verse. The scripture also tells us that that harmony comes from God, the master composer says that God would grant 
you harm you. God gives us endurance and encouragement. He grants unity. This is why it's important to live close to God in prayer. Prayer is not the preparation for the battle. It is the battle. Verse 6 gives us a picture of worship. Revelation 5. We sang the Revelation song, which is based on Revelation 4. But Revelation 5 gives us a glimpse around the throne of heaven. And it says, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you purchased people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and kingdom and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked around and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and the elders. And their number was countless, thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Every tribe and every nation worships around the throne. When we come together, no matter our background, God grants us that encouragement and endurance to serve our brother and sister so that we can glorify Him and worship Him with one mind and one voice. Finally, we have a command to do exactly what it says here in the Great Commission. How we live out what Paul is telling us to do. How do we do that? How do we follow verse 2? Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good and build him up. How do we practically do that? Well, here's a practical way. I asked you to look around. We do that when we build up our neighbor, but when we walk beside them. Someone once said that we should each have a Paul and a Timothy in our lives. A Paul, uh, actually a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Whenever we, whoever we are, there's always someone stronger in the faith than we are. And that doesn't mean someone who knows their Bible better. It means someone who knows God better than we do. And leans on him better than we do. We need to have that person in our lives so that we can go to them and let them speak into our lives. We are Timothy to their Paul. In the same vein, there's always somebody who knows is weaker in the faith than we are. Unless you're a new Christian, you need to work with that person helping them along in the faith. It takes time. That takes resources away from what you want to do. But it says that we are to bear the weaknesses of, of those without strength and not to please ourselves. It requires selflessness, but we have an obligation. This is called making disciples. This is why I said we have a command of the Great Commission. The Great Commission tells us to, as we go, go into all the world making disciples. This is what we're called to do. That's not my job as the pastor. My job is to equip you guys to do that. So this is the first part of the equipping. If you're not already speaking into the life of someone else, you need to be speaking into the, their lives. Lack of unity was not a problem unique to the church in Rome. Paul battled division in almost every letter he wrote to the churches. In Philippians 2, Paul implores the church to live together in unity as Christ, with Christ as their example. And he says it like this. It illustrates what Paul is saying here. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. 
Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a serpent, taking the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who are you living for today? Are you living to please yourself? Unbeliever, Christ died for you. so that you would believe in him and have eternal life. If you are here trying to win that race, if you're here trying to work on your own endurance, if you're trying to hear, here trying to be, encourage yourself to, to make it, you're putting your faith in the wrong person. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. Have God as your encourager and as, your, as the provider of your endurance. He will carry you through. Believer, Christ died for you, and you have an obligation to live for others. So who are you living for? Who are you living for? Who's your Timothy? Whose life are you speaking into, walking beside, and carrying their weakness, building them up? Today, it's, right now, we've come to the time of uh, commitment, where we commit our lives to what God has called us to. What's God called you to today? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray as we come to this time of commitment that you, O oh Lord, would be glorified, that you would be lifted up, and that we would commit, Father. Lord, your, your Holy Spirit has worked today. I sensed it. I, I'm, I'm praying, Father, that your Holy Spirit would do his holy work, convicting the loss of their need for you and empowering your children to live out their obligation. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So we stand and sing, come just as you are. Come just as you are. Everlasting
Thank you for being here today, and I want to recognize our people who are going to be involved with VBS this week. If you are going to be a teacher or a leader or a, a guide uh, 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 or working with snacks and, and directly involved with the kids, would you raise your hand? All right, look at, look at these volunteers. If you're going to be there supporting us through, through being um, uh, just that person who can be there and, and uh, maybe working in the back of the room or uh, making sure that we're staying safe, would you raise your hand? All right, if those who raise their hand first, go ahead and raise their hand and keep your hands up. I want you, everyone to see how, much, how many people are being, uh, Annette, get that hand up. People can't see you all the way down there. All right, listen guys. These are the people who are going to give this week their resources and their time to help the weak, to lift up the weak. And so let's pray for them. Father, you are a great God, and I just thank you for each of these volunteers. I thank you for the ones who are not in this room who are going to be helping us. Lord, I pray that you would Give them the strength for this week. Father, this is going to be a hot, tiring week, and we're not going to make it without your strength. Lord, give us your strength. Give us your grace. Give us your wisdom. But Father, we pray most of all, not for our leaders, we thank you for them, but we pray for those kids. God, help them see you. Help them to understand the price that your son paid for them. Holy Spirit, draw them to the son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.